let's start. Hi, everyone, and thanks for coming for this month's webinar. And this is going to be the last in a series of playwright webinars that I do, uh, for at least for a while. And this, this one's going to be like after playing with uh, playwright and yeah, kind of a, making my mind of what I like and don't like. I'm going to talk about how to use it to write better tests. I will, of course, talk about the features of Playwright, but uh, features are not that important, right? Who likes tools anyway? But uh, remember that tools help us uh, to, to achieve our goal. Achieve goal. Our goal means, in this case at least, write tests um, quickly, and make sure that they actually work, that they are stable, and I think the most important part is that because we are going to see these tests again, uh, make sure that the tests are maintainable, readable, all sorts, all sorts of abling things. Um, if you have any questions as I'm going, please write them in the Q&A box. I'll try to get them in the end, uh, but let's start. Um, Thank you again for coming. I'm Gil. I'm a trainer and a consultant, and I work with developers and testers and uh, playwrights, apparently, uh, people who want to make software better. Uh, I'm the author of these two books. I train, I consult, I make webinars. I have YouTube videos as well, uh, short ones. Uh, you can check out the video, uh, my, my channel there uh, for all things testing and development as well. So. You're joined. You're welcome to visit my uh, YouTube tent. I want to uh, say that what we're going to talk about today, uh, I do a whole course with of using Playwright for web automation. So if you're interested in that, uh, ping me, let me know uh, either through the chat window or uh, after uh, the session. That's cool too. We all like plays. Okay, so this is uh, this is a slide I always show uh, whenever I'm talking about tools, which is yeah, a lot. Um, the thing is that today playwrights the 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 best hot new thing, and. Um, it is going to be there for a while, and then there's going to be another one that is better. Or um, Selenium 5.0 will come out and will be at least uh, as good as it is. So uh, we need to remember that tools are tools. They help us achieve what we want to achieve. And uh, if we're sculptors, I think good sculptors uh, make, make do with any kind of chisel. So. Uh, Use the tools, try them, and see if they work to solve your problems. That's basically what I want to say. Um, so let's start um, talking about tips for better playwright tests. The first one's not going to be technical. The first one will try, we'll try to answer, well, should I jump over the playwright uh, boat? and try it so my, my question about the answer about trying is always yes but if you have like no tests at all playwright is a very good point to begin if you have selenium tests like loads of selenium tests um playwright's probably going to be better in terms of more stable tests and um more readable tests, but I suggest not, not not converting everything that you have into playwright. That that doesn't make sense. Uh, the tools can ride side by side, um, so may, consider that because like tr transforming a whole uh, automation uh, test suite into another tool is going to take time. Usually, that's not worth it. If you're on is, uh, you have a bunch of tests written in other frameworks, like something like Cypress, for example, then I would say, yes, try Playwright. But at this point, like Playwright has, it's a bit better than Cypress. 
in terms of speed and stuff like that. But uh, I, I don't think this is going to be like a big jump uh, from what you have right now. Again, try it, see if you like it. Um, remember that what if we're comparing to Cypress, Cypress works in JavaScript, uh, Playwright works in other languages. Um, so, so consider also the people's going to write the tests and what they know, uh, the tools that they, they are using. And so uh, think about how not just this is a new tool, let's try it, but how it's, it's going to fit into your the rest of your uh, testing workflow. And this is very important because we, we don't want to disrupt the workflow. So uh, think about these things as you're going in. Again, trying a new tool, uh, it's not that it doesn't cost you, it does cost you a bit, but understanding uh, at least how it feels in your hands or in your virtual hands uh, is something that I, I, I recommend doing like whenever you come up into something new. Whether you should involve this in your whole testing workflow, like I said, if you don't have any tests, yes, yeah, start there. If you have other tests, play with it first, see what it adds to the, uh, to the table uh, and see if it works for you. Okay, so the next uh, the next thing I'm going to talk about is uh, locators. And what you see on the screen, of course, is uh, XPath and uh, get by role. So I want to switch if it will let me, let's see. Okay, so what you see on the screen is the help uh, on uh, locators uh, in Playwright. And you can see all kinds of things there. Um, if you have, I'm going to first like go to the bottom here. So out of the box, uh, Playwright supports both CSS selectors and XPath. So if you're used to working like that, I hope you're not, but that's okay. Um, whatever you have, you just do page.locator, CSS equals, or XPath equals, and then you put in whatever you used to. But you will see that uh, throughout, the uh, throughout the documentation, the recommendation is not to use this. It is to use mainly locating by role, like page.get by role. So what is this? What, why, why get by text? What is this role? So, um, Let's say you're looking for a button. Let's start looking for buttons. How do you look for a button? So you think, and you probably be, will be right then, looking for, uh, this is an HTML page, it's going to be a button a tag. You look for that as well, and that's okay. Uh, but you won't always have this. You'll, you'll have a button, you'll have links, but check boxes, look like options, stuff like that. The thing is that Sometimes uh, what we're looking for is not really there. Well, let, let me explain this. So uh, this is a result text box. Uh, let's see here. I'm going to inspect it. Okay, so this is my inbox. It has an ID result. But um, just the ID, it's not the label. The label that I actually see on the screen is this one, okay? You see that it has a for label, uh, for attribute, which points to the ID of the result, points to this one. So what does that mean? When I, me as a user uh, looking at the screen and uh, you tell me, well, put something in the result box, I will look for the label result and say, ah, oh, this is the text box that I will look for. And I will fill that in. So in my case, the text box uh, is uh, really an input uh, tag wrapped by a div in, and there's a label there somewhere that references this text box. So as a user, I understand visually, uh, go to the text box named result, this is what it actually means. And using page by role or get by role is exactly that. 
the idea of roles or ARIA roles uh, is based on accessibility. Uh, tools that runs automatically, not just that automation, uh, and understand from the HTML what the user can actually see here, stuff like that. So it's not like interrogating just the plain HTML. It's understanding from that uh, what I'm actually looking for. And that's a good thing because when we're talking about test automation or web automation in our case, um, it's not like just finding tags and manipulating them. It's trying to fit the workflow or trying to follow, mimic the workflow of a real user, what a user will do. And what will a user do? He looks for a text box uh, called result, which he doesn't even know that the text box is inside a div which has a label in it called result and points to that. So the idea of get by role is first of all, um, try to mimic the user workflow or how the user thinks. Why is that good? Um, well, why do we automate tests? We automate some kind of scenarios uh, that we assume in our case, uh, a user will actually do. And working by roles, roles could be buttons, checks box, links, all kinds of things, headings, uh, is more aligned with how a user will do that. And this is something that we actually want. So we want our tests to basically follow something that is uh, sort of a user scenario rather than how an HTML is uh, written. And you can do, you can find roles by different uh, ways. You can uh, have by an attribute role inside a tag. And this is something that most frameworks that you work with today, like React and uh, and Angular or Vue, uh, they just, when they create the HTML, things are, are already in there to support roles. So first of all, I suggest like reading a lot about accessibility and stuff like that. Uh, I've been getting into that uh, a lot lately and understanding that uh, get by role is something that is recommended. The second thing of why it's recommended because the way the user workflow works is that things can change underneath in terms of HTML, but the workflow will still make sense in terms of user things. So uh, the get by role, even I'm, something that happened to me, I, uh, uh, I, uh, replaced a library, a UI library, something from uh, something I went to from uh, something which I don't even remember to material UI. And it still worked because uh, I was still going for the same role. So even an implementation is completely different as long as the roles, which makes sense, uh, are there, we can still work with that. So use get by role, get by text, try not to use uh, XPath and CSS because they're a lot more fragile. Things can change in the hierarchy of the HTML. Uh, we, we would like our test to be more stable than that. Collaboration is important, as we can see. This is, I usually use this program in my pair programming thing, but collaboration works as well. And this I want to take, I want to talk about uh, another type of collaboration, which is uh, test IDs. So uh, let me jump back to my browser, this one. So what are test IDs first? If you don't, if, you, if you're not uh, familiar, test IDs or data test ID or attributes that we can put in the code um, in order for test automation tools to find them when they look for something like get by test ID. So you have that in Selenium, Cypress, any framework knows that. The idea behind it is that if there are things that are hard to find or they're dynamic and uh, will appear like or somewhere without an ID or uh, something floating, which are things that are hard to locate or cells within a table, which are, we really need specific things. Um, it's hard to find them. Like either I have to count the cells or an item in, items in list, or I will use XPath to that specifically for that cell. 
and uh, or something else, but it's this like we said, it's very uh, very fragile, and things can change. So the thinking is that if we put special attributes for testing in the HTML itself, what will happen is that when the automation tool finds them, like get my test ID. Uh, it will actually be able to manipulate them. So this, of course, is supported by um, by Playwright and other tools as well. Uh, but it does rely... And by the way, there are tools to remove these attributes. If you move to production and you don't want these things to appear in production, uh, a part of your build process can remove them as well. So they can be used only for testing and not uh, just used in production, well, which sometimes creates a bigger load on the uh, on the on the HTML that we're passing around. And don't want to expose uh, test IDs, stuff like that. Um, it does require some kind of collaboration uh, because uh, I, as a developer, I need to put in this and me replacing the hat and uh, doing the automation will look for that here, like this. And this is not like a one-time collaboration. This is like ongoing because for each uh, page that we're going to use or components, we need to say, well, these are things that are going to be easier to find if we put these things in. Therefore, we will put these things in and uh, we'll find them. What you see, by the way, on the example is using the test ID here to have whatever button that we have, regardless of what the text on it. So it's like a trick in order to, if we do localization, there's going to be a different name uh, if I do get by role, for example. So this can also work for that. Um, so we, we Basically, what we're talking about is collaboration and methodology. We need the, the tool is there; it will support us, and uh, it will allow uh, using uh, whatever we put in to find it. But but we do need to work together in order to uh, understand when we're going to put that together uh, to in the in the code itself and how to extract that. Uh, try to do this only for the things that are hard to find because like we said before, the get by role, get by text are the things that the, the commands that we are encouraged to work with in Playwright, uh, the area roles, uh, and that's what we want. Um, yeah, so remember there is support for test ID and use it uh, together as a group. Uh, let's go back to my tips. Okay, so if you've seen my uh, last, yeah, my last webinar about Playwright, I kind of, uh, let's say, didn't have too many good words on the test generation, uh, the code generation part of uh, Playwright. And, and, uh, and uh, I hope this uh, live coding, which will work right now, uh, will explain why. So uh, what am I doing first? Let's show you in the browser again. So basically this is like a reverse thing, like uh, the page I'm going to do. So we have one, two, three. Uh, I need to put something here, reverse, result here. So if we, uh, I know very smart. Uh, if I look at a test that I wrote for that, um, it will look like this, go navigate to the, in the reverse, find the text box called input, uh, that's the label on it, uh, fill something in, find the button, press click, find the result box, uh, and ma make sure that it is like reversed. Okay. So what, uh, what I want to do now, hopefully it will work, is... Uh, to show you how the code generation works. So I mean, I'm using uh, Visual Studio Code here and uh, the extension allows me to record new. So I'm going to click that. You see it's already created some kind of template here and you won't see it until I show you. Hello, 
Yeah. So I'm going to do the same thing, right? So I'm going to type here HTTP localhost 3000 reverse. Voila. I'm going to, first of all, uh, you see that it already tries to identify what I'm going to, to do. Cool. I'm going to write uh, one, two, three, reverse. And then I'm going to use this thing, the third value on this. Basically, I recorded things, right? OK, so let's see what we've got. Uh, okay. So this is the pay the test that it created. First of all, of course, the name is very familiar because of, it appears a couple of characters before that, but uh, I need to do that so, uh, something about it. Second thing is the navigation, which is okay. Uh, you will you may remember in my regular test, Things start like with the base URL, which is a feature of uh, a play rate that I don't need to specify the base URL every time. It's a part of the config, but the code generation uh, does not know that or try to ignore that. So puts everything here. Then it does the placeholder. It identifies the text box, the original one, the first one, by the placeholder, not by the label. First, it clicks on it, which I admit to clicking, but will not write the click as part of the automation, then finds it again and fills it with what I did, then finds the button, clicks it, then writes the expect by get by label this time, the result, not by placeholder, to have value. So it does work, can't complain. But I, like you have seen already, I would write this differently. First of all, I don't need the click. The second, even if I did need the click, uh, there's going to be a lot of duplications because this is how the code generation works. Uh, I would probably put it in a variable or a constant, use that variable. Um, I would also uh, work on the readability and put the locators. Uh, let me show you again what I did. I can do these things, but if I have locators, I I, I might put them uh, like somewhere else in the global state. And the final thing, I will identify the text box differently, like find the text box by input or by the name of the label, rather than how it is easier for the thing to find it. By the way, remember I showed you that the result box, um, it knows how to find it by looking at the four attribute on the label, right? I'm guessing the code gen at this point is not smart enough to do that. And this is why it does get by placeholder. So what am I saying? Code generation is okay to do some prototyping, prototyping um, finding locators that are into, uh, how to find, uh, maybe even give you suggestions of how to attack things but I haven't found one single way that I will say, ah, I'm going to leave it like that. So I'm guessing this will change over time and will improve. But at this point, don't do this. Uh, you can start, but you always need to refactor. So yeah, you can stop. Thank you. Um, so, be gentle with the code generation, uh, or it might hurt you. Which leads me to another point, which is about refactoring, about removing the application. So this is part of it is a play, right? Thing, this, but part of it, part of this is like an uh, automation engineer thing. So removing the application is something that we should like. Software school, the first day we're talking about a node application. Why node application? It's a cold smell. Uh, we don't uh, like to dupli uh, duplicate things because then we have to maintain different versions. Uh, we need to say, if we need to change something, we go to one place and uh, do that uh, as well. So uh, we need to 
and the problem that we never talk about, we have to remember all these places that we change, we need to change. So that's another problem because our memory is not that good. So if you're using the code generation, uh, of course, is it creates applications like it does this for you. Uh, but this is the playwright thing. And the, the, the us thing is more like uh, once we have the, uh, for, uh, a working test, uh, we usually look for something to start with. We copy that, modify a bit, and then what we've copied, as good as it is, or as bad as it is, we now have the application of it. So refactoring to remove the application is something that needs to be very active in our minds while we're doing this thing. Um, the way I, I have sort of a rule, which I break all the time, but it's sort of a rule. When I um, see, when I've duplicated something twice, meaning I have something like three times, and I'm on green, just running. Yeah, so then it's time to uh, remove the duplication, extract a method, extract a class, whatever. Uh, remove the duplication there. You can have your own rules, but at least have them and follow them because uh, the applications can be nasty. This is how we get to blocks of um, page dot get by role, blah, blah, blah. It really is very, very hard to follow and uh, we need to do something about them. So uh, the application is very important uh, and specifically with playwright. Okay, so we don't duplicate where, where to put things stuff uh, stuff in. So playwright works differently uh, than for example, Selenium by using um, the locators. It, it does auto weighting, which is nice, but you can use the same locators uh, because it recalculates what the reference to what it uh, points to whenever you're actually using it. So when you do, you're doing a click or when you're doing an expect, only then it uh, it does this and it recalculates. This is why if it doesn't find it, it complains that not that it's not there, but it, it didn't appear in time. Uh, so. Yes, um, but apart from that, uh, the good thing is that with this thing, you don't have stale elements anymore. anymore. But let's see how what we can do in order to uh, reformat our code or uh, do something about uh, the coupling that we talked about, the, the applications that we talked about here. So. What you see on the screen right now is basically uh, the uh, the same reverse test that we saw before, like this, but a bit more organized. So uh, I'm using a before each, and I moved the locator definition here, uh, the navigation here. We're always starting from scratch, and then I have shorter tests with better names. So put and I put the uh, variables here. So this is a bit more organized uh, in a couple of ways. First of all, if I need to add another locator, I have a place to put it. If I need to do something as part of the setup, I know where to put it, and I have differentiation. So I'm looking at the tests. I know exactly what's the difference between them with that because nothing is duplicated anymore. So out of the box and a lot of uh, uh, tests that you'll see are looking like that, but if you've worked with any framework that there is out there, uh, you know there's something like a test suite. So in Java, in, uh, in C Sharp, it's called test classes. Um, if you worked with uh, Jest or Jasmine, we have as describes, of course. So you can do that as well in, in Playwright as well. So you have test describe. Uh, well, it doesn't look like it. Uh, it, it looks exactly like this. Uh, uh, but uh, th this creates another thing that we here we kind of miss. Um, 
here, if I, I can run, you can see like this is the extension that I'm running. I can run directly from the, the file itself uh, each test, but not all of them together. If I do, I have to run it either from the command line or go to the test explorer and find that. With the suite, where did the suite go? Sorry. With the suite, uh, I can have something that's running from here as well. Just because I put the describe here, because the extension is smart enough to say, ah, oh, well, I can run all these tests because they belong somewhere. So why is that important? Um, usually it's important because uh, something that I'll get to in the end, organization basically helps us do stuff. Uh, usually it's about finding where to put things in, uh, but also how to run things. It also helps with where to put stuff in terms of bits of code. And uh, I, I think that's important. I think that's one of the things that you'll see as you're pushing through uh, uh, different features of Playwright is that it comes with a testing mindset. It says, well, it's not like I'm going apart from the code gen, I'm guessing it still works, but um, I'm not just going to uh, help you create tests. I want to push you towards something that are a lot more readable and maintainable. So use the features in order to do that. Uh, and like I said, code generation doesn't play by these rules yet. So if you look at the expects that, uh, that we have, in, in Playwright, if you looked at uh, both JS DOM and React testing library and Angular testing library, stuff like that, you'll see a lot of resemblance there because I think they took it like as a, as a reference. And that means that we have sometimes two ways or more to do things. So let's look at that. So uh, this is a test that checks that the button is disabled in the beginning. Okay, so navigate, find the reverse, and we can either check that the button is disabled or check that the button is not enabled. Um, if I'm doing the reverse thing, I can check that the result is the either has a value, which what we did before, or uh, has a value that corresponds to some regular expression. This is the second one. Or not to have some kind of regular expression pattern. So Playwright gives us an, a way to do all kinds of things, and sometimes with redundant ways. Uh, the enable, disabled, hidden, visible to uh, are always uh, things that are well, what, what should I what should I check? What, what should I check and what should I check here? And I'm kind of on the bubble on this, but uh, I, I will go with what I learned so many times in regular code, and that is, people have uh, a problem understanding and not condition. We understand this to be better. So it is possible to use not. Try not to use not. Um, it's more readable in terms that people understand it or understand it faster, better. And regular expressions are very good. Um, it's a good tool to have. The problem is that a lot of people don't speak regular expressions because they're not regular. So uh, try to limit the use of that. Try to have um, uh, maybe s replace them with constants that explain exactly what they're doing. Like this is a date or starts with something. Um, but um, this is this is like a recipe for bugs. So uh, and bugs in the test and these bugs in tests are something that we really don't like. Uh, so try to keep, and this is like uh, whatever Playwright gives you, it's up to you to write something that is more, um, let's say, responsible. So uh, there are sometimes ways to do uh, more than one thing. 
I'm more of a guy uh, who's thinking about uh, the pit of success. Pit of success means there's only one way to go, which leads you to uh, to success, and uh, because otherwise you get in other ways. So, uh, but I'm not the design guy for playwright. Can give you my opinion though. So beware of these things. Uh, they have implications, not like disastrous implications, but time implications. Sometimes living bugs. Uh, someone wrote in the chat, I think Cogen is good enough to start for easy and mid-level complexity test cases. Of course, there's always for improvement, but even we need to refactor our own code at the end, so I find it okay to have an application of refactoring. Yeah, yes, but uh, I, I consider that someone else on your team wrote this kind of thing. So yes, it's a good starting point, and, uh, but it, it, this is not something you would probably want to have as a standard of this is how we write code in the team. So uh, refactoring is a must at this point, as I see it, uh, because you probably wouldn't want this kind of code in your code in, in your source code uh, vault or whatever system that you're using. Um, yes, it's a good starting point, but again, this is like something that you probably don't want to go get into when it when this the, the new guy goes on vacation and uh, it fell on you. So uh, you will be cursing very loudly when you do it. So um, this is about code quality and standards in the team, of course, and you how to do these things, but yeah, you are responsible for code quality in your team. Yes. Let's talk about isolation. So this is uh, not a playwright thing, but it's a sort of a playwright thing. So uh, let's look at the code again, because uh, code is nice. Yeah, let's talk about this. Uh, so this is an increment. Uh, I'll show you how it looks like in my browser. Yeah, so this is the application. Uh, mind chattering, I know. Uh, click on this, increments the counter. But what you don't see is that at the beginning when the page loads, the zero is not really coming from the screen. It comes from a database. It's an API call. Um, so in different scenarios, I would like to issue an, another API call to set or reset it for to zero or something else. That's the scenario. Let's go back to the code. So I have two scenarios here starting from scratch and I call the API first to increment the counter uh, and set it to zero. And then I expect to have it zero, and then after clicking, I have one. And then the second scenario is going to be uh, resetting it to five, and then uh, checking that it's five, clicking six. Yeah, ma makes sense. Uh, but you see that this is in skip. So if this is running, yeah, this works great. Now, if I just remove the skip here, Let's see if the live coding thing works. Ah, you see that it holds here and it will fail. Why is that? It, it expects to see five, counter is zero. Okay. Okay, so what happens here? Um, the server written by yours truly is not a good server. Uh, so, um, I'm talking about isolation right now. And if we look at, and, and this is something that we need to be aware of, uh, because uh, one of the things that uh, playwrights put a lot in front of us is the isolation. When we're running a test or a series of tests, they run in something called the browser context, which is sort of something like incognito mode. Uh, each test starts like a different browser context and therefore is isolated from others. Uh, no cookies, no local storage that uh, we can dip our hands into. So it kind of drills into our hands that things are running in isolation, which is true until you get to the server. This one looks like if I, these tests completely look the same apart from the values, right? So uh, maybe the names I can change to make them better in terms of differentiation, but 
I say, why is this working? Why is this not working? And then this will work if you just start out the server because it would actually work. But like I said, I, I created the server. I know how bad it is. So our minds or our uh, thinking goes to, well, obviously these tests will run as in isolation, means I can run this by itself, this by itself, these two together, and I can expect the same result. This is not true if you take into account that the server may not be running as you expect it to run. And this is like um, a problem for the brain. Like uh, it's sort of a dissonance between what we expect and what we've been told to the result that we see. Now, this is probably not news to you. Okay, uh, I'm saying this though, because uh, a lot of the things that Playwright tells you is it's isolation. And it's true, everything the client runs in isolation, and no like dipping into somebody else's pocket, but it's true until you get to the server. So if you want to actually understand things, why they happened, why things broke, uh, you need to train your mind to say, well, when I'm running these things, yes, as, but if I'm calling the server something that like APIs or things may change on the server as I'm running this, this isolation is no longer true. I cannot rely on it. And that, when I always say that most of the time we don't have fragile tests, we have fragile servers, um, we, we have to train our mind to think about it like this. It's not the tool. The tool promises something that actually works. How we use the tool to do things that we need to do actually has an impact of how we perceive success and failure of tests. Okay, so this is going to be a bit convo uh, bit something that I might go into uh, 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 discussions, let's call it, or arguments uh, with other people. But, and it's not a playwright thing. It's a web automation thing. I'll just show you how it looks in a playwright. Uh, but it does come to the, to, to the point with using playwright features because it's important. That is like, if I, if I was doing like a code generation thing, I usually uh, do like, do this, do this, do this, do this, and record a whole bunch of things. And I can write these things as well. And I get to something like this. So let's look at the code again. This is, uh, okay, let me show you what this is. Uh, so we'll see. So uh, if you've seen any of my previous uh, webinars and playwright, so I did this uh, registration thing and uh, what the feature I'm st uh, starting, I'm talking about right now is this, when the page loads, this is disabled, I have to enable it by this clicking here because I, everybody has fun reading the terms sheet. After that, uh, there's validation. So if I try to press here, there's going to be an error that all fields are filled correctly. Uh, and putting something here uh, actually clears it. And then I get another error and then another error cleared and so on. And the email, it always checks that all the things are not empty and the email looks like an email. Okay, so let's go back to the code. And this is somewhat organized uh, code that does that. It goes to the register and then clicks the term checkbox and then checks that the button is in, uh, enabled and clicks it and make sure that the error is visible put something in, make sure that the error is not visible, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on. So this is like, and I even put my comments in because I needed to remember what I'm doing here. So um, this can work, obviously, but it can also look like this. If I split the test to what I'm checking. A validation error when all the fields are empty, validation when the first name is not empty, when the last name is not empty, when email is not empty, and when the wrong email pattern. So I think you'll agree, this is a lot more readable than the last one, uh, because it is. 
Uh, and not only uh, I, put, I picked better names for that, uh, the, the tests are shorter, smaller blocks of code, easier to read, and can actually be a lot more readable than that. But I uh, kept it here. Um, but there's a but. This is where the arguments come in. Whenever I'm running, uh, if I want to run all this, they each run will run from scratch in its own browser context, which means it's going to be slower than running it once because the loading of the browser happens. Where's my unsplit thing? The unsplit things here. Here, the navigation, the browser context is a single test. It runs once, it loads. So the startup thing, the startup time is going to be uh, duplicated across tests. And that is true. And I'm not sure if this is the bottleneck and we can argue about that because I will actually ask for uh, uh, evidence that this is not only running slower because this I can actually agree. I. I I will ask ask how it that it actually delays you, and it, it, it in some cases it will it can amount to a bigger delay, and uh, I think I'm come from like a point of view that the time that you're going to spend reading these tests and maintaining them is a lot longer than what you have to wait for, and uh, usually I'm right, but take that into account. You can split things into smaller uh, tests. They are more focused. You can run them more together. They are more stable because uh, whatever happened like thirty steps ago might fail. Uh, might, might fail you now, which will not happen in smaller tests. So shorter tests, not only more readable, more maintainable. Uh, they are usually a lot more stable because they depend on less dependencies or less steps. So uh, that's the good thing. Yes, it comes with a price, and uh, it may you may not want to pay the price, but if you actually come from this point, try to at least measure what, what is the cost of splitting things up. Like when it will run, um, how much delay it causes in the system. And if you're in a horror movie, like uh, this guy here, don't split up. It never works. Okay, so names are very important, as you may well, no, uh, and I'm not just talking about names of tests. Uh, there are also uh, variables, of course, but also names of classes and methods. And the way we're using, uh, especially, and, and I'm not put, I'm putting playwright as part of a group here, but in, in the, this group is famous, Selenium, Cypress, whatever, uh, for using terms like elements, locators text boxes, whatever. Uh, and uh, we we kind of get used to that, but the user doesn't. The user uh, looks for something in from the application domain. And the problem is that we have, regardless of tool, is that we have different languages in the tests. So uh, names help us uh, renaming stuff from like uh, methods and uh, variables do help us as well. And uh, so, we have to refactor. I'm going to show you an example. So this is the registration workflow. I didn't show you this, but when we click register, it actually works. It actually goes to a thank you page and show you something. So you can. I'm using here page object model, which you probably want to use because page object uh, model is basically two patterns uh, that I have been in software since the 70s. It makes sense still uh, since then. It's a separation of concerns, put some things that don't, uh, are not relevant to each other in different things, like different pages, so elements running the screen. Uh, so we have a register page and a thank you page, and all the locators and the strings and uh, uh, things are sitting in the right place. And the second thing is abstraction and or, in, and or encapsulation. And I'm using here different like, things like type in the last name, type in first name, type in uh, type email, 
And I did that because I don't want to see first name box, last name box, email box, promotion checkbox. Why? Because I, was, I may be used to that, but I want to see something like this. Type in the first name, uh, type in the first name box, any first name. Type in the last name, any last name. Type in email, e valid email, because I want to specify that this is a valid email. And all these things like register page and the methods themselves and submit, which is submit and do the navigation and then verify message displayed with any first name. So all these things helps us tell the story. And this is good. This is like about names and you can have register process with valid data store directly, uh, valid data and stores data correctly because uh, this one actually checks the database. This is nice and do that, but you can take this a step further because the same thing we can tell it in another story just by changing the names. And it will look like this. So create registration page, okay, but instead of checking the checkbox terms, agree to terms. First name is this, last name is this, email is this, uh, submit, then display thank you with this. So we can play with uh, names to make it more readable and with the, the, uh, the absolutely no end for that. But as we try to move towards using the... Uh, uh, domain uh, wording rather than uh, the lower level tools, it becomes easier to understand. So this was the 10th ten, now, right? But of course I can't leave you with 10th, give you another one. This is about test organization. Um, always put kids in cupboards, this is keeping the house organized, but also think about how you organize your test because, um, uh, just look at what we have here. Uh, so basically we organize the tests in a certain way. Uh, it makes uh, sense to us um, in two ways, usually about functionality or workflows or topics or whatever, because it has to basically answer two things. Uh, where do I find uh, the next, where do I find a place to put the next test in? And the second one is like, if something failed, I know where to find it. But usually I'd like to see because of the, the way we duplicate things, uh, usually when something failed, I want to also see what also uh, is working. And usually I want this to be in the same place, usually the same file. So. Uh, think about how you organize the tests, uh, be, the way you run them, the way you, by the way, run them. Uh, that means also separating slow tests from uh, sh shorter tests, because uh, we don't want to we don't want to run all the short tests along with the slow tests. It will take a lot of time. Uh, based on functionalities, come to some kind of agreement inside the team of how you organize this, and this doesn't have to stay like this forever. Uh, these things that move over time as well. So uh, think about organization uh, and move things around, try these things and, and use them not just because this is we agree, this is the tree of the application. This is how it makes sense or logical to do this by features, but also uh, this is how we run our test. This is how we debug our test. This is when we something mm -hmm. fails I want to look at. So it has a lot more than that. Uh, think about organization and remove the kids from the cupboard at the end of the session. That is also true. Um, so just to summarize, I, I've gone to a couple of things here that I think are important while we're using Playwright and you can apply the same things for any tool as well. Uh, things to think about because at the end, the tests are supposed to help us. Uh, it's not like something that we do and forget about them if there were we wouldn't, the code generation would be enough. But we're going to go into these tests again. And we probably want to use the tool as best as we can and as safely as we can and as quickly as we can to help us with our regular work. So these things I hope will help you as well. 
Uh, just to remind you, there's a whole course about using Playwright for web, web automation. I also do Cypress and Selenium. If you're interested, uh, give me a call. And that's what I wanted to share with you today. Thank you for coming today. I hope this was valuable. And I hope to see you next time on the next webinar. Bye-bye.